as it has been said by, uh, by Antoine, I served in FIFA during 11 years. Uh, I have to say, and it's not very modest about saying that, but I try to do it with all my time, devotion, commitment, and honesty, trying to never lose the sight <laughs> of the universal nature of the game and the necessary justice for the sport of football. In FIFA, it was my privilege to witness closely, and I say very closely, some very remarkable moments of the history of the game. The launch of the Gold Program in 1999. I have to say one thing, that when I joined FIFA, there was around 200 national football associations, 150 of them had no headquarters, no technical center, no football field. We will launch also the Win in Africa with Africa program in 2006 to make sure that the African countries would benefit from the impact of the first ever Africa World Cup organized on African soil. I can also mention the fact, because we're here in a sport loan institute, the fact that on March 5th, 2001, we signed an agreement with the EU Commission on the new transfer regulation. I'm skipping a few things. But I want to, uh, with emotion, remind you of the Saturday 15th of May 2004, when for the first time ever, uh, the World Cup was organized for, the decision was made to organize the World Cup in South Africa. Mr. Mandela was in the room. And I can tell you that we had to fight and defeat egoism. And I stress my word, egoism, including from Europe. I want also to uh, mention something because we in a, Sport Law Institute. In November 2006, we signed between FIFA and FIFPRO, which is located here in Uppdor, close to Schiphol, the first ever agreement between FIFA and the World Players Union. And I'm very happy to see a member of FIFPRO here. And in fact, basically, it was the embryo of what could constitute a future world collective bargaining agreement for the industry of the game. Um, I want also to mention in 2008, in October, on the 26th of October, the inauguration of the first ever international stadium in Palestine. And if you know the history, and you know the history, you know the situation, these kind of things is absolutely unforgettable. There were also moments of doubt and difficulties. The bankruptcies of ISL, the bankruptcy of Kirsch, the fact that a month after 9-11, the German branch of the French insurance company AXA canceled the tourism insurance company of the World Cup 2002. I can tell you it's not easy. It's not easy neither when you have to deal with the government whose minister of sport wants to change the president of the federation because he wants to change, or because political elections have changed the majority. And I want to say at the personal level, how it is to go on stage in front of 1,500 persons and probably tens of millions of spectators and to draw a draw of the World Cup. But if I'm here, it's because I have two passions, and the two passions are spheric. The first one is clearly the planet. As it has been mentioned, I'm a career diplomat. I'm now not retired. I can't go back to the French Foreign Service, but I served in the French Foreign Service during 14 years in countries as diverse as Oman, Cuba, Paris, of course, and we have to go back, uh, Los Angeles and Brasilia. And um, I have to say, and I'm talking with people coming from all around the world, when you travel, you learn a lot of things. You discover yourself, you discover others. You have to learn the capacity of listening, of humility, and to realize that basically the world is constantly moving and changing. But as I said, I have another passion, which is spheric, which is a football. For me, football started in my life in 1970. As I said, I'm older than you. When I discovered on a black and white screen the World Cup 1970. And it was clearly a form of revelation. I worked, when I was a student in Paris, I worked during seven years as a freelance part-time journalist in the French weekly magazine France Football, the one, as you may know, uh, giving the Ballon d'Or, and it was one of the references because I don't want to be seen as an arrogant French guy, but I have to say that between Jules Rimet, who invented the concept of the World Cup, after that we had Henri Delaunay, another French guy, who invented the concept of the Euro, and we had two journalists from L'Equipe and France Football in 1954, or that's a true story, on the paper tablecloth of a French restaurant con designed the concept of what is today the Champions League. And I worked at the privilege to work in France football during uh, seven years. 
between 76 and 83, working on the ranking and the articles on the foreign leagues. After that, in my diplomatic career, I felt absolutely privileged to have been called to work between 97 to 98 as diplomatic advisor and chief of protocol of the French World Cup 98. And I can tell you, nothing prepares you for that. I worked in FIFA during 11 years, as I said, as an advisor to the president, deputy general secretary, director of international affairs, and I had to leave. Actually, I was pushed out for political reasons. Uh, and I want to say, we'll have a question and answer session after that, and I will answer all kinds of questions. Nothing is under the carpet here. <laughs> um, since I left, I developed my personal uh, international football consulting activity, and I'm very proud to say that I, I worked, or I still work, as an advisor of some uh, football federations in the world, like uh, the Palestinian, then the Kosovo, like the Turkish Cypriot Federation, and I'm very happy to see some Cypriot people here, and uh, it's a fascinating case what we have been doing in Cyprus. I worked also as an advisor of the Congolese club Tupi Samba Zambe, of the city of Lubumbashi, close to the border of Zambia, which is, in my views, probably the best organized club in Africa. Anyway, that's my life, and I don't want to, uh, to be too long about that, but I want to explain why I decided to stand as a FIFA candidate. In the past 40 years, football has undergone a huge change. And basically, the globalization has transformed the game completely. Today, there is no doubt that sport, football is a sport number one in the world. I know that some people from the Olympic, I see, or other sports may, may see that with a certain degree of jealousy and envy. But the reality is clear. Look at what happening. For example, it is estimated that this World Cup will be seen at least one match by more than 3.2 billion persons. For example, the World Cup in South Africa had an estimated TV cumulative audience of 26 billion viewers, which means a crazy guy like mine, like me, who has watched 64 matches, I'm counted 64 times. But you imagine that what it means. If you, if you want a comparison, the TV cumulative audience of the Olympic Games is 5 billion. And don't forget, you have one opening ceremony with 1.5 billion, one closing ceremony with 1 billion in the middle of some sports. Um, why did it become so huge? Um, because football is definitely the sport, the most democratic sport ever, the cheaper sport, that a sport you can play without anything. You don't need a basketball net, you don't need a cricket bat, you don't need a, a, a skis, you, you, the cheaper sport. Secondly, it's a sport which is so democratic because you have, we have 11 positions on the field and because of that, every morphology of our diversity can play. If you're not tall, you cannot play basketball. If you don't have some certain skills and qualities, body qualities, you cannot play. And last but not least, the history of the game has made that football has played such an important political and, and social role. We don't have any African here, but if you look at how football was brought on the continent as a tool by the colonials, <laughs> colonialists, in order to, uh, to, to, to impose their rule, and for example in Africa to eradicate local African sports, and very quickly the colonized Africans seized sport as an opportunity to break the rules of segregation and racism and use it as a fight, as a tool to fight for the, for the independence. And if you look at the history of, of African football in the past 50 years, it's basically about the position of Africa in the world. And we are in an international city and this question is still unanswered. Last, also, uh, other reasons why we have benefited so much of this globalization is because we have seen an exponential growth of the number of TV channels, and that definitely has played a big role. Not to mention the fact that some structures like FIFA, UEFA, national federations, and sometimes governments have played a big role in uh, developing the game. However, the globalization, as you know, uh, has been positive, as I said, for the game. But as for the rest of the uh, human activities and universal activities, the globalization is bringing some challenges. And that's why I see three challenges for football because of the globalization. The first one is definitely the way competitions have developed in the past 10 to 15 years in a very, very elitist way, with a significant and, and always increasing imbalance between continents, inside continents, and inside leagues at the national level. Between continents, 
I think it's very, very clear to observe the fact that there is more money today in African football, in South American football, in Central American football, in Asian football than 20 years ago. But the problem is that the gap with Europe has increased. And I just want to focus on Africa. As I said, when I joined FIFA in 98, a lot of federations are nothing, in particular in Africa, but not only in Africa. Just think about East, the eastern part of our European continent. But if you look at what is the situation, we have invested heavily in African football. We have organized a World Cup in South Africa. But basically, the position of African football in the world has not basically changed than the position of Africa as a well. whole. If you buy one kilo of coffee to, from an Ethiopian coffee producer, it's one dollar. If you go to Starbucks, and I'm not paid by Starbucks, but if you go, uh, I'm not here to promote Starbucks, but if you buy one, the same kilo of coffee in Starbucks, $13 which means that Africa is losing $12 of the valorization of the product. If you look now at football, in spite of all what has been done for Africa, including, for example, the change of the binational rule, which enables, for example, a team like Algeria to have benefited with, out of the 23 players of Africa, 16 are like me, are French citizens, and because of the change of the rule, they are allowed to play for the national team of their second country, and that's great. In spite of that, the position of Africa has remained producer of football raw materials whose valorization, whose added value is taken by some other uh, actors in the pyramid of football. Between countries, and I want to say I'm a European and I'm proud to be a European. 25 years ago, and here we have uh, some, uh, some friends who come from uh, the part of Europe which was, uh, we were separated from or you were separated from us. I want to say that in spite of the Cold War, in spite of the Iron Curtain, in spite of the Berlin Wall, European football was united. The Real Madrid of Franco Spain was able to play against partisan Belgrade of Tito's Yugoslavia without these two countries having diplomatic relations. Uh, other example, in 88-89, Barcelona played in the UEFA Cup home and away matches in Vlora Tirana, and it was difficult. Look at 85-86, when, for example, a Hungarian club of, of um, Csikszentmihalyi's Var, Video Don, they reached the final of UEFA Cup. They eliminated in 16th in the round of 32 Paris Saint-Germain. In the round of eight, they eliminated Manchester United. And in the final, they played all men away versus Real Madrid. It's not possible anymore. It is not possible anymore. We have broken the Iron Curtain. We have united Europe, we all benefiting from Schengen, and we have substituted a political iron curtain by a financial football iron curtain which makes European football divided. And that's not acceptable. Look also what happened. 20 years ago, European football was more or less homogenous. And today, we have a situation, for example, where the club which has finished 20th in this season, English Premier League, has made the double of, mon of money than the club which finished French champion, more money than the club which finished third in Spain? How can you have a playing field which is fair and correct when we accept these things? We are in the Netherlands. When I opened my eyes to football, that country was at the top. Can you see today Ajax Amsterdam reaching the final of the Champions League? Why? It's because all the clubs, <laughs> and most of the clubs, 99% of the clubs in Europe, have an economic model where they train kids and they sell them as soon as possible, abandoning their sporting chances against money received immediately to survive. That's what we have created in European football. We have created a machine of inequality, a machine of concentration. I can give you a very concrete example because I'm coming now to the third point. Inequality and imbalances inside a national competition. Let me talk about my country. We have one Qatari club, Paris Saint-Germain. We have one Russian club playing outside of France in Monaco. And we have 18 French clubs who can only hope to finish third. That's the situation of the French league. I can give you a very concrete example, and I don't want to shower you with too many statistics, but you are your students. Why is the English league so sportingly interesting and economically successful? Because we have to look at the ratio between the amount of money distributed to the team finishing first and the team finishing 20th. The, in the English league, is 1.5 to 1. In the German league, which is very competitive, is 2.1 to 1. 
In the French League, 3.7 to 1. Italian League, 4.1 to 1. Of course, you have the example of Spain, which is 11 to 1, because they don't sell their TV rights in a centralized manner. But let's look at the Champions League. If you look at the figures we have for the Champions League 2012-2013, between Juventus Torino, which made 65 million euros, and Dinamo Zagreb, which was uh, the club receiving the least of money of the 32, is 6.5 to 1. And if we include the playoffs of the champions of the other countries, which are eliminated in August, it's 32 to 1. And you understand when you look at this, how we collectively, and I say we, football administrators, we have created a machine to create inequalities, to lower the uncertainty of the sport result, to create difficulties. And now in the past 20 years, most of the decisions on the field of play are basically influenced by decisions and money outside of the field of play. And that's why we have a problem in the game. Look at what's going on in the World Cup. You have national teams playing, <laughs> and you have uncertainty of the result. That does not exist in club football, where more or less the ranking at the end of the season corresponds to the ranking of the budget. Second problem with the globalization, the privatization of the game. Don't get me wrong, I am pro-globalization and pro-business. If you want to build an artificial field in a country like Lesotho, Moldova or Bolivia, an artificial field costs a million dollars. I belong to the kind of people, because I live in a country like Cuba, who believe that before trying to distribute wealth, you have to create it. But I tell you something, the problem we have, and I'm sure that you, we may have questions about what FIFA does with its money, uh, we have today a problem where people invest in the game for a lot of other reasons than, than football itself. The national, team are, the national team are challenged, and you know that a lot of big clubs in Europe would like to have a system which is, which is different, where the national league, national teams would have less importance, less relevance. Um, you see also, and we are in a European Institute on Sport Law, what is the impact of the Bosman case, and we can discuss that if you want later. The number of players eligible to play for the national team of England, playing in the English league, has decreased from 70 to 32 percent in 20 years. Look at the result, it speaks for itself. And I want to mention the fact that uh, the European Commission has a very, very heavy responsibility because in order to exist in sport, because sport is not, as you know, an EU Commission competence, they have decided to consider sport as any other economic activity. And as you know, you have plenty of case law saying that a sport rule is submitted to the EU law as soon as it has some economic consequences. Which means that basically the decision of a referee to give a red card or the rule giving the right to a referee or the competence to give a red card is submitted to EU law. You think I'm joking, but if you're, I think someone is from Italy, but I think it was a season 2003 2004, there was a penalty, I think, in Udinese, and the club, because of that, didn't win the league. The following day, the stock exchange on Rome, the stock went down. And the, because there's a law in Italy against uh, criminal destruction of wealth, uh, some fans owning shares of that club went to sue the referee. That's in the crazy world where we are. The third reason why globalization is creating a problem is because there is undoubtedly a loss of prestige for football and the credibility of its structures. Of course, uh, the media and a lot of people are disgusted by the behavior of some of the footballers who forget where they're coming from. We have also the, the allegation of the way football manages its money, and it's a real issue. For example, we have a clear controversy surrounding the vote in the 2nd of December 2010 regarding the World Cups 2018-2022. But let's not fall in European arrogance, because it started already in the past for European bidders. And also the fact that basically, and we have all seen the, the re recent results of the European elections in the Parliament, the fact that more and more people have a feeling that the institutions in charge of regulating and managing the, uh, the globalization have not done their job. And football institutions is no different than the others. In summary, I would like to say why I decided to, uh, to stand. Because in 2015, we have to make a decision which will impact not only what FIFA will be, but what football will be in 2030. Either we will continue this elitist evolution, what I call the NBAization. And don't get me wrong, I live five years in Los Angeles, and I adored watching matches of the Lakers and Clippers when I was there. But the thing is that football is now facing the risk to become like basketball. 
let me tell you why. In basketball, only one competition matters, the NBA. And there's clearly a fight today between the English League and the UEFA Champions League <laughs> to say who will be the NBA of the world. Secondly, as you know, in basketball, national team competitions have no relevance. And if you look at the success of the World Cup, for example, uh, even in the United States, the matches versus Ghana, 25 million Americans watch the match, more than the final tie-breaking match on the NBA. Okay, still a quarter of the 100 million watching the, uh, the Super Bowl. But today, football has won in the United States. But as you know, in basketball, the national team competitions have no relevance. But in football, it's essential. We have been built all our history of sport on two legs. Club football, which divides, which is weekend after weekend, and national team football, which unites. And it is clear that if we continue this elitization, as I said before, a lot of bigger clubs do not want real national team competitions. And last but not least, if we continue like that, you know that the International Basketball Federation has barely no regulating authority on the NBA. That's why I decided to stand because with my experience as a diplomat, as a person and a football administrator, I always defended to go to protect this universality. Because the other alternative is to reinforce this universality. But to do that, to do that, we need a FIFA which is more democratic, a FIFA which is more respected, and to be more respected, it has to be more respectable. And, and in particular, a FIFA which is more voluntary, more proactive in fighting the consequences, the negative consequences of the globalization and the imbalances which exist. That's why I'm standing. In 2012 and 2013, before becoming a candidate, I sent some documents to, uh, to the federations before I announced, and you can find all that on my website www.jeromechampagne2015.com and I've decided to present a concrete platform and I'll tell you why. First, I do consider that we need to continue what has been done correctly in the past 40 years. What has been done correctly in the past 40 years? Development, solidarity. In the, in the first 24 years when Mr. Avalanche, first let me go back one step. You have to know that when the African independence uh, happened in 1960, suddenly FIFA changed. Basically, it was a club of Europeans accepting some noisy South Americans. <coughs> but suddenly arrived 40 African federations. And they were like, we don't agree with this, we don't agree with that. And don't forget, the African federations boycotted the World Cup 1966 because they were not given a direct entry. And what was the, re the answer by the FIFA president at that time, Sir Stanley Rose, he said, you're not good enough. They boycotted. And Mr. Avalanche, and of course with the support of the military dictatorship of Brazil, felt that it was an opportunity for Brazil to change its image using the game. And of course using Tele, using the national team. And unexpectedly, Mr. Avalanche defeated the incumbent president. We had to wait until 1974 for FIFA to develop development programs, but there was no money. I want to tell you that in 74, there were eight employees, one competition and no money. Until 1980, FIFA had to borrow money from the Swiss bank in order to pay the salaries of the four, coming four years. Between 74 to 1998, FIFA was spending $1.1 million per year on development program. It was nothing, it was peanuts, but it was just the beginning. And suddenly in 96, 97, the value of the TV and marketing contracts were multiplied by 10. Since 98, the average of spending per year is close to 150 million. And the result is there. Look at the, the map of football. When you see a country like Cap Verde, which can reach the quarterfinal of the African Cup of Nations, you say, wow. If you scratch why, you know why. Because investments were made. Look at a country like Panama. In the 80s, football was a sport number four in Panama. After baseball, after boxing, after basket, look, they're nearly qualified to the World Cup. The world is changing and football is changing. So we need to continue that and we need to do more. Second thing we need to do is to continue taking the competitions all around the world. The World Cup has the world, the world, world inside. And what we need to continue is to be strong on some principles. I want to remind people when all of our governments were refusing to sever ties with the uh, apartheid South Africa, FIFA expelled the white federation of the racist South Africa in 1976 at the uh, Montreal Congress. So we need to continue this. 
whether it is discrimination, whether it is uh, uh, racism, whether it is gender inequality. And if women's football became so big, it's also because a lot of investment were made. So we need to continue that. But I'm totally also standing because I want to male football and FIFA to enter the 21st century. First, as I said, the fight against imbalances. We cannot continue the game like that. It's not possible. We know the ranking. Look at what the Champions League became. We eliminate the smallest clubs as our focus. For example, if you're the champion of Macedonia, you're rejoicing on the 1st of June and you eliminated the 15th of July. Is that logical? That's something which, which is a problem for me. And uh, the Champions League is absolutely previsible until the quarterfinals. So, I tell you, a lot of people I'm sure in this room do not watch the Champions League the way we were watching it before. But what we need to do is a program of, of change as well. And I propose three pillars in my program. The first one, we need to democratize, democratize the, the FIFA. I'm sure here in this table, around this table, because you watch TV and you read the media, but do you know how it functions? I'm sure you believe that the FIFA president, let's put the name of Mr. Blatter once again on side, you think he's almighty. The system is totally undemocratic. I'll give you a few examples by showing you my concrete proposals and you will see by the opposite what's going wrong. In the democratic system, the people elect a candidate he or she is elected on a program, he or she has to implement, and to do that, he or she has the right to pick up the government to implement a program he or she has been elected for. The FIFA is not like that. I've attended close to 50 meetings of the FIFA Executive Committee, and to give you an analogy, because we are on, on people uh, who, who understand that, it's as if President Obama would have to govern his first mandate in the White House with inside his government, John McCain, he had just defeated, who is trying to seek revenge. It was the case of Mr. Johansson, who tried to torpedo any of the initiatives of Mr. Blatter. And already Mitt Romney in the government, trying to help the first one to torpedo because he said, in four years, I'm going to run against you. It's an anti-democratic system. In a democratic system, there is a, polit a political decision and then a government to implement. Other example, FIFA is a federation of national football federations. Why the federation are so important at national level? Because that's the only place where we can balance the needs of amateur <laughs> football and professional football. When we can balance the need of the top clubs, the professional clubs, and the need of the national team. It's the only place where we can balance the need of the immediate results, participating well in the World Cup, but also the long term into developing talents and creating young players for the future. That's why the national FAs, he can be here, the, uh, the, the Federation, the CFA in Cyprus are so important because that's the only place where we can integrate clubs and players, leagues and amateurs. So FIFA has been founded in 1904 for and by FA. But in the past 20 years, the confederations have taken the control of the FIFA Executive Committee. Don't get me wrong, the confederations, and you know them, are playing a big role. But I want to stress one thing. Do you think, it's a question, are the confederations members of FIFA? Yes or no? Who knows? The confederations? Yes. Okay, he's wrong. The confederations are not members of FIFA. The confederations are to FIFA what the English Premier League is to the English FA. A decentralization, a delegation of competence to organize competition. But they're not members of FIFA. It's as if the English FA would, uh, the English Premier League would decide everything for English football. And the problem is, the problem is, is that the elections of the members of the FIFA Executive Committee are, con are controlled by the Continental Confederations. And as I said, I've attended 50 of these meetings, where in fact, instead of being the government of FIFA, the Confederation Controlled Executive Committee is more a stock exchange where the president of the six continental confederations exchange their blocks of votes in order to say, you want this, you get that. When I joined FIFA, it was still possible for two members from the same continent to disagree. Now they receive voting instructions. And imagine a government where non-members decide for the government and for the members. And if you look at a lot of issues, I can give you a very concrete example because I have nothing to hide. 
Two months ago, the Telegraph in UK said that the former Qatari president of the Asian Confederation, Mr. Bin Amman, has been allegedly given, was allegedly given $2 million to the former Trinidadian president of the CONCACAF North America, Central America, Caribbean Confederation. All the medias in the world said FIFA, FIFA, corruption. These guys are in FIFA because they have a continental position, and FIFA is blamed for the behavior. With inflating the format of the competitions, with creating new competitions, it's not FIFA, they're the, comp the, the confederations. And because they control the government in FI on FIFA, they obtain what they want. And FIFA is blamed for that. So I want to restore, I want to restore, and it's part of my program, I want to restore the centrality of the power of the national football associations because they are the ones representing football. That's why I've proposed that we would reorganize the executive committee by giving the presidents of the national FA the majority of the seats inside the government because it belongs to them. It doesn't mean that we should put aside the confederation because they play a big role, but they cannot decide. What I've also proposed, to rebalance between the continent. FIFA is no different than the debate regarding the reform of the Security Council of the United Nations. Look, the, my country is a permanent member, but it's an inheritance of 45. FIFA is no different. Europe with 53 football associations has eight seats in the government, while Africa, while Africa with 54 has four. According to what? Uh, look at what's going on, the reform, the current reform of the voting rights inside the IMF, where Belgium has more voting rights than China. And we cannot reform the IMF. So FIFA is no different than that. So if you combine what I'm saying with what I said before, it's as if the, General, the Security Council of the UN, instead of having countries, we would have a representative of the African Union, one representative of the Gulf Cooperation Council, one representative of the ASEAN, one representative of the EU, instead of having countries. It wouldn't work, and it doesn't work in FIFA. And last but not least, as my institutional reforms, I think in the 21st century, we cannot govern the way we did in the past, vertically, feudalism, religions, never discussing the, the, the decision of the fathers. The world has changed. Now it's functioning much more horizontally with inclusion, with uh, uh, interest groups, so, uh, social networks. So that's why I defend that now, if we want to modernize FIFA and to modernize the way football is handled, we cannot have, and we should have, inside the FIFA government, representative of FIFPRO, representative of a world association of leagues and clubs, because you cannot have an agreement on transfer regulation if you don't include in the discussion and in the decision the representative of the employers and the employees. So first thing, reform of the institutions. Second pillar, fighting the imbalances. As I said, I'm really strong on that. We need to create a world fund. We need to find ways to make sure that the big clubs will only use the checkbook as a policy. We should force them to train. And I heard that someone wants to change the limit. I'm totally against it because we know that this system only benefits the wealthiest. I am for the freedom of movement. But the reality is that this system has been abused by the wealthiest in order to distort the competition of the game. We need to also make sure that uh, uh, the, the leagues, which are making so much money outside of their territory, will contribute to the development of local football. I can give you one statistics. The English Premier League made $40 million per year out of India, reinvest zero. Think about yourself, after your studies here, you've been hired as a CEO of the professional league in India. You need to fill up your stadium, you need to make sure that your players are played, you need to make sure that your, the clubs will form the future players of the national team of India. And you have seven matches of the English league during the weekend without any restriction. Good luck. Third aspect, I think we need also to rebuild, as I said before, the feeling that this globalization of the game is governed. And of course, as I said, we need to change the image. As I said before, a lot of criticism level at FIFA are unfair because people do not know how it works. For example, if you look closely, <coughs> if you look closely at the past year, some reforms were blocked in the Exco, not by Mr. Blatter. They were blocked by the Confederation, for example. It has been largely documented, but it never reaches the public opinion because it's more complex. So, but I absolutely recognize that we need to reconcile FIFA with the people of football. This is why I decided to adopt a different style. I do believe that this election in 2015 shouldn't be a coronation. It should be an open debate. That's why, for example, I put a platform. I created a website where everyone can see what I've proposed. 
and what I'm committing myself to implement if elected. But also I've proposed one thing, and that's something, I tell you, I, I, I vie for that very quickly and very soon, when the list of the candidates will be known, to have public debates in front of the 209 president of the FAs, but also, I proposed that, and I got very good feedback from the TV station, that we will have a kind of US presidential election debate with lecturers, with moderators, and the people of football can send questions. Because, let me tell you, my feeling of, of FIFA is that it is our government of the game. A young boy at the age of eight signing a contract here in a club of the egg is an indirect member of that pyramid. And if we want to correct that, we need to change the start. We need to be more respectable, more humble, more transparent. I have said, for example, that I consider FIFA being the government of the game. And for that reason, the money of FIFA is like taxpayers' money. And if we know the salary of Mr. Obama, I'm sure maybe we know the salary of the king of the Netherlands, probably, yes. Uh, why don't we know the salary of the executives of FIFA? Having said that, I tell you, I'm not motivated by personal honors or things like that. I think the only thing which is important for me is that this globalization, which is so amazing, look at this World Cup. The World Cup is probably the only event which can connect a Vietnamese and a Bolivian who have nothing in common. You can say music, but music has different styles, different languages for the lyrics. Football doesn't need interpreter. And that's something, at the same time, in a world which is so fractured, so unequal, dividing us between passports, social classes, skin colors, genders, whatever, football is uniting us. The only human activity where we can be proud of who we are without hating the others, and we need to protect that. That's why I do believe that FIFA should be a model organization, not only for the game, but also for football and the rest. So today, our imbalances in the game are a greater challenge. That's why they're endangering what is the very strength and the promise of our proper sport. Basically, the universal nature of the game and basically the opportunity of each of us on this planet, not only to participate, but to win as well. So I very much thank you for your, for your attention. I would be more than happy to answer your question. Thank you.